If you're having trouble understanding what photographers and YouTube creators who talk about cameras are saying, here's my guide to help you understand the basics. Now, this is part one about hardware terms. Part two talks about the settings you use to properly expose and focus an image. You'll likely want to review this before you purchase a camera. That way, you will know what the salesperson is telling you and the features to look for. That will help you make sure you don't buy more or less camera than you need. In general, my guidance is get a camera you can afford, one you like the look of, one that excites you enough that you want to go out shooting with it every day, one that you never want to leave behind. Or early on in making your decision, you'll wonder if you want a mirrorless camera or a DSLR. Although there's lots of discussion about which is better, they're not really very different. The important difference between these two kinds is how you look at the image in the viewfinder. Now, a viewfinder offers a bunch of advantages. There are disadvantages too. You can't always get your eye behind a viewfinder, like low or high angles. And a DSLR has an optical viewfinder, meaning that you see the scene exactly as your eye would looking through the lens. A mirrorless camera has an electronic viewfinder, a small screen inside the eye cup, which shows you the scene in kind of a preview of the photo you're about to take. So you see the results of the exposure settings before you record the image or the video. On a DSLR, you use the camera's meter, which is usually incorporated in the optical display to show you the exposure. Now, whichever style you prefer, with a viewfinder, you'll find that your ability to compose is better, the camera is steadier, and your hand-eye coordination is better. Following a fast-moving object with a zoom lens on an LCD display is uh, challenging. DSLR-style cameras are usually larger and heavier, not always, and are the older, traditional kind of camera. Many feel that the DSLR is inferior and will soon be found only in museums, but that is an unfair exaggeration. If you've been creating photos with your phone, it doesn't have a viewfinder, so you use the screen. Nearly all cameras have a screen on the back, which you can use just like the phone. Like the small screen in a mirrorless camera's viewfinder, it also shows you an electronic preview, so you may be wondering why you even need a viewfinder. And many don't use the viewfinder, but the advantages of electronic viewfinders, which is a long list from being able to shoot video to expanded view focus assist, have converted me. Now, I've reviewed cameras that have one fixed lens. Those cameras belong in a category called bridge cameras, but mostly I review cameras with interchangeable lenses. Uh, that means that the lens can be removed and replaced with another. A camera that supports interchangeable lenses can usually be bought as a body only or with a lens, which is called a kit. <laughs> That's why the lens that comes with the body is called the kit lens. Now, by and large, Kit lenses are of average quality, so calling a lens a kit lens is throwing shade. Let me explain the value of being able to change lenses. So there are many general purpose lenses. There are even more specific purpose lenses for nature photography, both for close-ups of butterflies nearby and lions far away, for portraits, for low light, for landscapes. Without interchangeable lenses, you'll be limited. And good lenses are fairly expensive. But interchangeable lenses can last a lifetime. And typically, you'd upgrade the camera body every two to five years. You'll never regret buying one or more good lenses. However, lenses are usually specific to a camera manufacturer. Nikon lenses work with Nikon bodies. Although the mounts for mirrorless cameras are typically not the same as DSLRs. There are adapters available making older lenses work with newer bodies. There are also adapters making Canon lenses compatible with a Sony body. They nearly always involve compromises. Often an adapted lens will require you to focus manually. You may judge a camera by its megapixels, but the most important factor in image quality remains the size of the sensor. Better cameras have bigger sensors. Back in the day, cameras used film and the only reason I mention that is because most cameras use 35 millimeter film. Well, now that sensor technology has matured, that's also the preferred size for digital camera sensors. In a digital camera, 
Instead of film, there's a sensor. A full-frame sensor is the same size as the film in this slide. Less expensive and smaller cameras often use a smaller sensor in the APS-C size, which some vendors call by other names like DX. Uh, these sensors measure about 25 by 17 millimeters, about half the area of full frame, and then there's micro four-thirds, about one quarter the size. And the one-inch sensor, 13 by 9 millimeters, I wouldn't go smaller. For reference, the sensor in your phone is even smaller, typically 7 by 6 millimeters. So in general, bigger sensors are better because they have a larger light-sensitive area and because they can create a shallower depth of field. A shallow depth of field lets you draw attention to your subject. Depth of field is the amount of an image that's in focus. When everything from the background to the foreground is in focus, the depth of field is wide. When just a little bit of the image is in focus and the rest is blurry, like this portrait with a soft background, the depth of field is narrow. Sensor size, lens size, aperture, distance all play a part in depth of field, but because of physics, the smaller the sensor, the more difficult it will be. Oh, one thing, a larger sensor requires a larger diameter lens, and that typically means a bigger camera and a heavier lens. It also means more expensive. So I do have a minimum megapixel count, which is 12, and that's sufficient for online use and most print sizes, but it's been years since I was concerned about a camera's megapixel count. And while bigger sensors are better, and they typically have more megapixels, sometimes less is more. A larger sensor with fewer pixels can capture more light. For instance, a full-frame camera with a 12 megapixel resolution is a low-light champ. Sensor size is also a factor in lenses. Most manufacturers make a series of lenses specifically designed for their crop or APS-C sensors, which, although they can usually be attached, they can't fill the full-frame sensor with an image. The reverse is not true. Full-frame lenses will work on both. Now, sadly, the APS-C lenses for most camera manufacturers are not their best. For that, you go to full-frame. So, to summarize, my ideal camera has a viewfinder, interchangeable lenses, a large sensor, and full manual controls. Manual control lets me set the three aspects of exposure, the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO manually. More about those in part two. And manual focus, although that's often a function of the lens. Now, why do I want full manual control? <laughs> I actually expect both auto and manual, and use the auto modes for most images. But when I'm not getting the results I want with the auto settings, I take over with manual settings. That enables me to take silky pictures of waterfalls, to properly expose a face in the shade, and do some advanced photo tricks. A part of manual control is having the right dials and buttons to change settings easily. That's a big deal. Depending on which settings you need to adjust and how the camera enables those adjustments can make your photography experience pleasant or painful. Although there may be some similarities between different models from a specific company, in general, they're all pretty different. And more buttons aren't always better. So that's one of the things I talk about in my reviews, what the buttons and dials do, and the overall usefulness of buttons depends on your style and the kinds of pictures you're taking. Although some models offer an onboard flash, which means you'll never forget to bring it, they're rarely very capable. Do make sure that the camera has a flash shoe, that's the mounting point on top of the camera, and an external flash, even a small inexpensive one, provides a great deal more flexibility and power. And the flash is useful for more than just low light scenes. Even in sunlight, a flash provides better lighting, particularly for portraits. Uh, nearly all cameras save images in the JPEG file format, which is compatible with just about everything. But my last must-have feature is support for raw format recording. The ability to save a file that's exactly as the sensor read it without coloration, compression, or additional processing added when the image is converted to JPEG. I don't always want to do it, but
but a RAW file has a lot more information and can provide a much better final image. Uh, that will require software like Lightroom or Photoshop to manipulate those settings. Uh, many cameras have in-camera RAW processing, enabling you to try multiple variations of color and other image processing settings after you've saved a file. Incidentally, I often use a RAW Plus mode, which saves both a JPEG file as well as the RAW file. Yes, it takes up a lot of space on a memory card, but they're so expensive that the compromise has never seemed worth it to me. And I'm Dutch. We're stereotypically frugal. Which brings me to my last topic, memory cards. Until manufacturers add onboard memory, which you'll find on every phone, you'll have to buy memory cards to save your images. The most common format is the SD type, which is not as reliable as you'd like. There are some models that offer dual SD card slots, so you have a backup if one fails. A few models offer the CF type or the larger and sturdier XQD type. Enough about hardware. Let's turn those dials. That's part two. For those of you who are inclined to subscribe, please click the button below. And as I said at the beginning, I'm not sponsored, so I don't stop in the middle to promote some product or service, nor do I allow YouTube to interrupt my videos with mid-roll ads. Those decisions make this a better channel for you, but they do have a financial impact. So I'm very grateful to those of you who have decided to support this channel by becoming a member. But subscribers need not worry. No content will be behind a paywall, and I will continue to read all civil comments and relevant questions and reply. Please choose the option below that suits your needs. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.